that's the, our world today and the way much of American policy making works today. The three struggles I talked about, which frame the nature of the problem in this country, are first, the point. Genealogy and politics, what's the relationship? Second, what's the relationship between the war on terror and in my mind, the terror of war? There's the war on terror and the terror of war. And thirdly, the third set of ideas is the relationship between Islam and politics. Let me go to the first one. It has been argued by much of the international community and others that Somalis are by nature clanist and that's the basis of Somali politics period. Political genealogy or the politicization of genealogy or pedigree if you like is the Somali way is the argument, and this forms the bedrock of Somali political identity. It's endorsed by the EU, by the United States government, by many NGOs, by the warlords, sectarian faction leaders, and many others. It's a very strange collection of bedfellows. The very people who advocate human rights, civil rights, democracy, are the very people who also advocate that project. For instance, I have always thought that Scandinavia was the countries in which democracy and human rights reign supreme. I had the fortune or the misfortune of being in Oslo, a beautiful city, not so beautiful in February though. And I was able to talk to senior folks in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and one senior ambassador told me that genealogical identity of the child is set at birth. And that's how a Somali child learns his or her politics. What he meant was that political identity is set at birth. In South Africa, we had a name for it, apartheid. But this is not coming from the apartheid regime of South Africa. It's coming from the, some of the most enlightened people on the planet, Norwegian diplomats. So I asked him, a rhetorical question, which was, I've been in Norway a number of times, I've seen fat Norwegians, not too many of them, slim Norwegians, blue-eyed Norwegians, black-eyed Norwegians, tall Norwegians, short Norwegians. Why is it not possible to create parties for these categories? Why do you have social and Christian Democrats and others? Why not have the parties for the blue eyes, the parties for the blonde hair, the parties for the fat Norwegians, the parties for the thin Norwegians, and segregate your society into those categories? He could not respond to that question. He thought I was joking. It's this mindset which has informed the so-called TFG. What is there an alternative to that in this debate between genealogy and politics. The converse of that is civic or communitarian politics. Most folks who advocate this particular project, civic project, suggest that political genealogy, rather than being the solution to the problem, is the problem itself. And that it does not represent Somali tradition. Political genealogy is the culprit behind the catastrophe. And that democracy via political genealogy is not feasible. It just simply is not feasible, as I was trying to impress on my Norwegian 
calling. That's the first debate about the nature of political identity, political genealogy versus communitarian politics. The second is the one on the war on terror versus the terror of war. Somalia has been, according to those who advocate the war on terror, has been either the source of terror, the route or route of terror, against the West, against Ethiopia, and consequently Somalia must be hemmed in by the anti-terror alliance. That's their argument, that the way to restore stability is to use the instruments of the war on terror by hemming in. Conversely, those who think of terror as war being the source of terror suggest that the first terrorist attack on the Somali poly politics took place in 1967 when both the Soviet Union and the United States, and now the record is absolutely clear using American documents, supported the same side in the democratic project in Somalia. One group, the Russians thought that Mr. Abdurashid Ali Sharmak, the late, God bless him, was their man. The Americans thought Mr. Mohammed Ibrahim Yugal, again, God bless him, was their man. And since Mr. Sharmak had promised Mr. Egal that Egal would be the Prime Minister, each was satisfied with their man and contributed to, the, to, do, to support them in the election which ultimately undermined Somali democratic politics. That was the first assault. The second assault, or maybe the latest assault, I should say, is the Ethiopian occupation that has been developed the country not only since December of last year, but where Ethiopian troops have been present in Somali soil since at least 1991. There were 5,000 troops in Baidawa long before the Islamic courts came to power. And so Ethiopian assault, the American and the Soviet's assault, has produced a kind of politics that we are dealing today. And it's not Somalis who are attacking America or the West, but that it's the undermining of Somali democratic project by the West and the East, and more recently by Ethiopia, and the terror that war has generated, which has displaced close to 2 million people over the last 15 years, and more recently 450,000 people just on Malaysia alone. It's that kind of terror that should be dealt with, which displaces people which destroys livelihoods, and so on and so forth. So the debate really is about the terror that war generates, and the war on terror, which is the real thing. The final item on that list of debates is Islam and politics. When George W. Bush was asked in his first presidency, which book he has read that has shaped his politics and values best. The journalist who asked him that question was thinking about sort of maybe Aristotle or Plato or what have you. And the president said the Bible in the White House itself. So it seems to me that some relationship in certain circles between certain religions and politics is fine, as in the American presidency currently. But that if you talk about Islam as the source of inspiration for creating a civic society, that's a no-no. 